Hello, in this video, we're going to take a look at how we can search an array for a match, basically for an item in the array. So sometimes we need to search through an array to find something. It's called a linear search. So let's pretend that we had a mail order business and we um, kept track of, of our items using an item number. Our item numbers are three digits. They're non-consecutive, meaning they don't necessarily go in order. Um, and, a, and we want to allow a customer to order an item, indicating the item number. But first we have to check to see if that item number is valid. So what we're going to do is we're going to create an array that holds all the valid item numbers. And then each time the customer gives us a new item number to order, we're going to check it against that array of item numbers to ensure that it is a valid item number. So what that entails is looping through the array, comparing the item number the user typed to each element in the array and to see if we have an, a match. We can do that by using what's called a flag. A flag is just a special variable that indicates whether an event occurred. So we can create a variable, for example, called found it and set that variable to false if it's a Boolean variable or n if it's a string variable to say we haven't found it yet because we're just starting our program. But then as we loop through the array, if we find a match, that flag variable can be updated to true. Found it is true or found it is y if we're dealing with strings. So we're going to utilize a flag in our next example. Before we look at that, though, let's look at the general technique for searching an array. We want to start out by setting a subscript variable, remember that's also called an index variable, to zero to start at the first element before we begin. Because when we want to search an array, generally speaking, we want to start at the beginning of the array. We also want to initialize our flag variable to false, or n for no, to indicate that we haven't found the desired value yet because we're just beginning. Then we'll use a loop to examine each element in the array, and if we get a match, we'll update that flag value. After the loop, we'll be able to look at the flag to determine whether a match was ever found. If the flag had been set to true or y for yes, then we know that there was a match found. If it had never been updated, then we uh, were not able to find a match and the item number, going back to our item number example, was not in the list of valid item numbers. So we would tell the customer, sorry, uh, that's not a valid item number. So the next example you're going to see is in flowchart form. Um, it does uh, basically build a program that allows the user to type in an item number. We search the array of valid item numbers to see if the user's item number they've indicated is in the array. We're going to do so in the context of a loop. So we're going to keep looping and keep asking for item numbers as long as the user has not typed 999. So uh, all of this logic, this searching logic, is actually built inside of a context of a sentinel controlled loop. Remember, sentinel controlled loop is a loop that continues as long as some uh, sentinel value has not been reached in this case, 999 is our sentinel value. So if you look at our mainline logic here, um, we'll dive into the details in a minute, uh, but finish down here 999 is what the user will type to end this loop. So uh, we're going to be checking finish shortly. So let's take a look at some of these other variables. Num item is going to be used to store the item. Uh, number provided by the user. Size reflects the size of the array. Valid items is an array of numeric constants of size 6. And this array is also, it's declared but also initialized in one step. It sets the values in the array. So 106, 108, 307, and so forth. These are valid item numbers. And this is what we're going to use to compare against the user's input when uh, they type in an item that they'd like to order. Sub is used uh, as our subscript value when we're looping. String found it is our flag. So um, 
we're going to go with the string data type. So we'll set found it to n at the beginning of the program. And if we find a match, we'll update it to y. So we'll see that coming in future steps. We're also going to keep track of how many times the user typed a bad item number. So we'll create a numeric variable called bad item count. And start it at 0, but each time they type an item that's not in our list, we'll increment that. And then we just have a few constants here, item available or item not found. Uh, these, these constants that correspond to the, I'm sorry, these messages that correspond to constants, message yes, message no, will be used to um, send the user the appropriate output dependent upon whether or not we found the item in our list. So we get started. Um, the first module called here is get ready. So get ready is similar to our housekeeping module that we've seen in previous examples. We prompt the user. We say enter item number or 999 to quit. So we're telling them how they can quit the program. We read in that first item and we return. As long as the item was not 999, so this is a sentinel controlled loop that keeps looping, as long as the user has not typed 999, we uh, look for the item. So there's a module called find item that we don't see here. We're going to look at that in detail in a moment, but it's a module that handles all the searching functionality. Now, had the user type 999, we would have instead proceeded to the finish up module, jumping over here, the finish up outputs how many times um, they had searched for invalid numbers. So they concatenate bad item count. So let's say they had, uh, you know, searched for three items that were not in our list, this would say three items had invalid numbers. So we can't see on this screen how bad item count is updated. We're going to see that uh, in the find item module coming up, but uh, we can see here how it's output. So let's move on and take a look at find item in detail. This is where the bulk of the program happens. This is the functionality where we take that item number that the user gave us and we search through the array of valid items to see if we have a match. So the first thing that we have to do is set found it to n. We have to indicate with this flag that we have not found it in our list yet because we're just starting. We're also going to set sub uh, to start at zero. Sub is our our index, so remember indexes are often called subscripts. So we want to start it at zero, and as long as it's less than six, so remember that will ensure that we're always in range for our array, we'll go ahead and compare item is item equal to, this is an if statement, if item is equal to, and then valid item sub is an expression that's going to evaluate to a real value at runtime. So let's walk through this. If, if we're going through this loop, the first time through, sub is 0. So it's going to say 0 is less than 6. Yes, let's go in. And let's say the user had typed in 107. Okay, Then it would say, is 107 equal to valid item sub 0? Well, let's look back. What is valid item sub zero? Valid item sub zero refers to the first element in this array, which is 106. And I believe I had said, is it 107? Well, those two are not equal. So we do not have a match. So we will not go down this branch. We will go down this branch, which doesn't do anything. It just increments sub. So sub now changed from 0 to 1, and we loop back around. 1 is still less than 6. So now let's compare the user's input of 107 to the next item in the array, valid item sub 1. That would be 108. Again, 107 is not equal to 108, so this evaluates to false, and we follow this path. You can see what would happen when we get a match. If the item equals the element in the array to which we are comparing, we would update the flag found it to yes. So eventually, after we go through all the iterations of this loop, sub will no longer be less than 6. Sub will finally be incremented to 7. So this test will fail, the loop will end, and we'll enter in a selection structure, in other words, an if statement, that says, was found it equal to y? In other words, did we find it? 
If we did, output the positive message. Otherwise, output the negative message that says item not found. And if the item wasn't found, we'll do one more thing. We're going to increment the bad item count by one. Remember I said that this variable we're going to use an output at the very end of the program to show how many times they searched for an item that wasn't in our list. The last two steps in find item prompt for and get the next item. And remember, in any Sentinel controlled loop, it's very important to update the loop control variable. If we go back to the previous slide, remember find item returns back and the next test is item not equal to 999. So it's very important that the last step in find item, and we see that here, is to output a prompt for and get the next item. So this program is complete. It basically would allow the user to type in items as many times as they wanted um, until when they're done, they would type 999. And with each item, we would enter into a loop. This is the loop right here that loops through and compares that item number to every element in our array. Um, and it would basically tell the user whether or not that item was found. So the book goes into a little more discussion, a little more depth, and talks about parallel arrays. Now the motivation here is, in that last example, we were searching through and looking to see whether the item number the user typed was in our list of valid item numbers. But what if we wanted to take that one step further and not only say, yes, we found it, but tell them what the price for that item is? So what if we created two arrays, each with six elements? The first would have all the valid item numbers, just as we had before, but we'd create a second array called valid item prices. And in that array, we would populate it with all the prices that correspond to the item numbers. Now, it's very important in this situation that they would be listed in the same order. In other words, the first element in the item number array would have to correspond to the price listed as the first element in the price array. So there's a relationship, an indirect relationship there based on their position. So when you have arrays and you're using it in this manner, we can call it a parallel array. So here's a picture of what I'm talking about. You know, we, we were already working with this array valid items up here. Um, these array access expressions are indicating how to access each element of the array. We're going to create a second array called valid prices. And it shows that, for example, item number 106 cost 59 cents. Item number 108 cost 99 cents and so forth. So what we'll do in our program is, if we do find a match, so say the user had typed in 106 as their item number, we would find that in our array and say, oh, we found a match, but we would go one step further and look at the corresponding price in the price array and say, your item cost 59 cents. So we would look at what position we're in in this array and look at the same position in the parallel array to find the price. So in this way, we're building a relationship between the item's number and its price. So parallel arrays can be very useful. So let's take a look. Um, this is the exact same program revisited. We're just doing a couple additions that are highlighted in orange here. We added a variable called price. We'll use that to store uh, a price value. And we needed the corresponding array of prices called valid prices that we saw in the previous slide. Uh, notice it's declared and populated, um, initialized here, with all of the prices. In find item, we do want to make an additional change. When we come in here and we enter this loop, this loop here, again, represents our searching functionality. So the first time through, sub is zero. And let's say that, I'll flip back here for a second, 106 is the first element in our um, valid items list. So let's say that the user had typed in 106. If that were the case, 
Then when we reach this if statement, item equal to valid item sub zero, valid item sub zero is equal to 106. You can see that that is the first element in that array. So we get a match. We said found it to yes, that's the step we saw before. But then we also look up in the valid prices array uh, the corresponding price. And notice we use sub as the index because that represents the position we're looking um, currently in the valid items array. So we're basically looking up exactly the same position in the parallel array to find out what the price is for this item. We set it to a local variable price. And then later, after we finished searching the array and we check was found at yes, in this case, since it was, we'll output the positive message, but then we'll also tell them the price of item 106 is, and then we'll output the price. So in this case, that would be 59 cents. So is 59 cents. So that's how we can utilize parallel arrays in our programs. So one thing about the previous example, you may or may not have noticed that even if we found a match in the array, let's say at position zero, at index zero, um, the loop would keep iterating through the entire array. And that really doesn't make a lot of sense because um, if you found a match, why are we still searching the array? So we can make our programs a little more um, efficient by setting a variable um, or, uh, you know, basically using some sort of indication to leave the loop as soon as a match is found. So it allows us to do an early exit from a loop. And what that means for your program is it's a little more efficient, a little more speedy. So let's take a look. The only change that we would have to do to make our loop a little bit more efficient is up here in our loop um, condition. Previously, we had said um, while sub is less than size. And we want to keep that because we want to ensure that we're still uh, staying within the bounds of the array. But we threw an and in here. And remember the uh, logical and is going to check both conditions. Sub is less than size and found it is equal to n. This second part, found it equals to n, will ensure that we'll only go back into the loop for a new um, iteration through it if we haven't already found it. So in the case where we found the item in the array in position zero and found it was set to yes, when we looped back around, although we're still within the bounds of the array, found it is no longer equal to n. So we would exit the loop early and continue on our way. So that would just make our looping um, functionality a little more efficient.